And now, to introduce this afternoon's distinguished speaker. Senator Benson's career began when he was elected judge in Hidalgo County, Texas, at the age of 25. Three years later, he became the youngest member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Following three terms in the Congress, he embarked on a very successful business career as president of Lincoln Consolidated, a Houston holding company. Sixteen years later, in 1970, he returned to the national political scene, winning a Texas seat in the United States Senate. His opponent was another accomplished businessman with an equally promising political future, an incumbent congressman from Houston by the name of George Bush. The rest is history. Senator Benson became one of the Senate's ablest and most respected figures. His business experience made him particularly adept with the issues facing the economic sector. Today, Senator Benson is chairman of the Finance Committee and vice chairman of the, of the, committee on, of the Joint Committee on Taxation. He also serves on the Joint Economic Committee and the Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. A lawyer by training and a decorated bomber pilot during World War II, Senator Benson was the Democratic Party's nominee for Vice President in 1988. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you Senator Lloyd Benson. Thank you, Bob, for a very generous introduction. I was thinking back to that race in 1970 as you recounted it, and I said to the President one day, I said, Mr. President, I think I did you a favor back in 1970. He said, Lloyd, I, I really think you did. He said, I just didn't understand it at the time. <laughs> and I'm delighted to see so many ambassadors here because the subject I'm going to talk about I have a hunch they'll be sending some questions up about it. Great time to be here at the Economic Club. What a moment of triumph for our country. What a sense of unity, of success, of putting it all together. Without a question, we're the number one military power in the world. But I would say to the Economic Club, it's even more important that we be the number one economic power in the world. The Soviet Union has learned what it is to try to build military power on a second-class economy. And I must say, we have learned through two centuries of progress that the underlying strength of America is its economy, its opportunity for its people. And if we want to continue that kind of a proud tradition and leadership, we have to adjust to the economic realities of the 90s. One of the most compelling, compelling of those realities is trade and what we do about it. I think for too long, trade in this country has been a handmaiden for foreign policy or defense policy or any other policy that the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Treasury and the Secretary of Defense said above the salt, and commerce was somewhere down here below. It was a sidebar. And I think we've suffered substantially as a result of that. I believe today trade has a new importance in the economic future of our country. We're in a recession. And one of the ways that we're going to work our way out of this recession is by increasing exports from our country. I think it's absolutely essential to our prosperity. We can't do it with pump priming from the government as we've done it in the past, not with $400 billion deficits and being the most indebted nation in the world today. We can't just stimulate it with lower interest rates as we have to depend on so much foreign capital to help hold this economy of ours together. So we have to export. 
But to export successfully, we have to have better market access than we have had in the past. And we have to have that for our products that are competitive. And to achieve that, we need an aggressive, directed trade policy for our country. I believe that one of the key elements to that success is a successful Uruguay round and bringing that to a successful conclusion. The President, as you know, has now asked, asked for another two years of negotiation. And I support that extension because I think that that agreement is critical. I believe that we can bring about a balanced, comprehensive agreement. And that if we do, that'll take care of knocking down some of these additional non-tariff barriers that have been raised. I tend to give that request a very prompt and a full hearing before our committee. But let me tell you one thing, it is not going to be easy. We have a situation that's developed on the Uruguay round where you have textile people deeply concerned about it. You have the agricultural people deeply concerned about that. And at the same time, because it's generic, when we talk about the extension of trade negotiations for two years under the Trade Act of 1988, it also includes the U.S.-Mexican Free Trade Agreement. And there you have the AFL-CIO, you have the labor unions deeply concerned about the great disparity in wages. The request for that kind of a fast-track extension is going to be extremely difficult to bring about, to be able to pass it. If we're going to embark on two more years of multilateral negotiations under GATT, then we have to know what the administration is going to do in the meantime and not just wait for those two years to pass. What are they going to do to help keep the workers here at home and to increase our exports? And I think that review is critical because during the past 10 years, trade has become a vital power and the economic growth of nations around the world, with the exception of the United States. And while the United States was putting vast resources and trying to wage and win the Cold War, we saw the Japanese, we saw countries like Germany emerging as enormous major economic powers in the world. We saw the Japanese putting together economic alliances around the Pacific Rim. Throughout the 80s, trade was a catalyst for economic miracles all over the globe, except for our own country. I think we've been slow to understand and realize the economic realities of what trade can be and what should be. And we have taken a terrible beating on trade. And running an accumulated trade deficit of some $845 billion and building a national debt of over $4.3 trillion. We saw our leadership erode in key growth areas such as semiconductors, machine tools, robotics. We saw things that were created and invented in this country now taken over by other countries, such as VCR and color TV and the microwave oven. And instead of exporting our high-tech products, we were exporting high-paying jobs. Never before in the history of the world have you seen a major economic power in the world take a, such a fast and a steep decline in its position on trade. I think to their credit that President Bush and Ambassador Hills are taking an interest in trade. And much of that rigid, turn the other cheek ideology of the Reagan administration has passed. But we still lack trade policies and priorities that I believe are consistent with the realities of the 90s. And we have to move on that. The, word, the world trade looks a lot different than it did 10 years ago. 10 years ago, Dolores had a dream about what was going to happen to Europe and bringing it together to develop economies of size. Now that's coming to reality as we look at Europe EC92. We're looking at 325 million people. We're looking at a gross national product of $4.6 trillion. We're looking at an economy that's very much comparable to that of the United States in size. We're looking at a situation where Japan is quickly forming 
a web of trading relationships along that Pacific Rim with incredible economic leverage. Now here at home we're talking about trading blocks, talking about the one with Canada, which I supported, and we've been able to put into effect. And now we're talking about doing one with Mexico. And the President is talking about Enterprise of the Americas, with the idea of extending that all the way through South America. I think that's fine, as far as it goes. I supported that Canadian agreement. I support the negotiations toward free trade with Mexico. But I also realize there's sure going to be some winners and losers in that agreement with Mexico. We're talking about free trade across the border, and I was born and reared on that border, have an intimacy, I think an understanding of it, but the only place in the world where you have a major industrial power up against a developing nation, where you're looking at wage scales that are one-seventh of ours, and a concern by many that that means a net loss of jobs, and that concerns me too. But I think with good negotiations and good trading that we can have a net plus. And that's why I've been supportive of the continuation of those negotiations and bringing it about. But I think we have to make it crystal clear that trading blocks or hemispheric trade zone is no substitute for multilateral agreements. Mexico and Canada are good friends, but they take only 5% together of the world's imports, while Japan and Europe are taking some 23%. If America wants to remain a world-class premier economy, then we need a strategy that's aggressive and it's global in its nature and lets us compete on equal terms in the major markets of the world. We need to be assured that regional trading blocks only become building blocks to free trade, and not islands of opportunity for those that have access. We can't just climb into a hemispheric shell and think that we've achieved our objectives. So a multilateral, strong trading system has to be a key element in the trading strategy for the future. For over 40 years, the GATT has been the centerpiece of world trade. And GATT had considerable success. Because when GATT was put into effect back in 1947, the average tariff around the world was around 40%. And today it's less than 10%. And gaining membership in that GATT has been a strong stimulus for countries to open up their markets. So it's a major plus. And throughout all of those years, the MFN, the most favored nation clause, has been the glue that's held GATT together. The MFN, is, as you know, says that if we give a concession to one member of GATT, then we have to give it to all members of GATT. If we reduce our tariff on semiconductors, for example, to the EC, then we also have to reduce it to Japan. We have to reduce it to countries like Brazil and India. I think MFN is important, but it also has an inherent weakness, and that's that it brings on hitchhikers. If some countries are willing to reach that kind of an agreement, then others will reap the benefits even though they don't do it, even though they don't give that kind of access to their own markets, even though they don't match that kind of a concession. And in past years, you've had a small group of countries that would lead the effort toward lower tariffs and non-tariff barriers, while many others opt for a free ride. Partly as a result of that kind of a policy, you have an average tariff today in India of 118 percent, while the rate in this country is less than 5 percent. And then let's get to bound tariffs, where you make a commitment on that one. In Australia today, 25% of their tariffs are bound. 75% are not. In this country, 99% of the tariffs are bound. 
That means if you raise that tariff, you have to pay a price for it. You have to compensate for that. But those that are not bound don't have to do that. So these kinds of conflicts and problems came into sharp focus last December in Brussels. As our negotiations got close to the finish line for the Uruguay round, we found some very major issues still outstanding. Liberalizing trade and services, as I look around these, these tables and see some of the people here, I know how much you're interested in the liberalization of trade services. But that's one of the things where there are only three countries, ours being one of them, that made any kind of a significant, significant offer at that time. <laughs> Now, I understand that major offers are not made till right at the last normally. But the other part of it, you had a lot of hitchhikers on this situation. A lot of free riders who had no intention of making those kinds of concessions. And that's a serious problem, I think, for the country. That's a concern because unless we get those kinds of meaningful participations by these other countries in those kinds of concessions, you have an almost impossible job in passing that agreement when you come back to the Congress. Now, how are we going to ensure that we get full participation? How are we going to eliminate these free riders in the deal? Some have suggested something called GATT Plus. The idea is that a smaller group of nations would reach a much more ambitious trade agreement, where if one made the concession, they, within that group, had to make the full concessions to be a member of GATT Plus. They would give each other the premium trade benefits, and the countries outside of GATT Plus would get whatever they would normally get under GATT. Membership in GATT Plus would, recall, would call for a much higher commitment, no hitchhikers. But I think there'd be powerful incentives for countries to join GATT Plus, and it would help ensure that the United States had full reciprocal trade concessions. Frankly, I'm intrigued by the idea, but it also brings up some problems. Who would join? What kind of effect would it have on current negotiations? How would it relate to the whole GATT system? And those kinds of questions need answers, and those are some of the things that we'll explore in the hearings of the Finance Committee. Because if we don't find some answer to that, I think it spells real trouble for the final approval of whatever we come up with in the Uruguay round. Here at home, I think we have to put more emphasis on exports. Because our ability to increase exports is going to be a key factor in the growth of this economy. We have a strong hand to play, the dollars that are low, we have excess capacity, some of our major trading partners are growing and growing fast, but we need trade policies that are going to prioritize the export potential of this country. We need an economic renaissance fueled by export-led growth that's going to restore real net growth to middle-income families that's going to increase productivity, revive our competitiveness. And that renaissance, I know, has to emanate from the private sector. We need to look no further than the utter collapse of the command economy of the Russians to understand that. But I believe if you look at the success of Japan and of Europe and of the Pacific Rim countries, I think they demonstrate that the best efforts of private enterprise are insufficient if government fails to create a climate that's conducive to healthy competition. Government is clearly not the answer. But I think government clearly has a role in helping find the answers. And that's true all over the world. Our private com companies are constantly competing against foreign entities that, restrict, that receive strong government support. We must determine how to respond, because if we don't, we'll be in a replay of the 80s, which really, those were the dark ages of trade for this country. The last thing that 
we need is an industrial policy by government that picks the winners and the losers. But I think our public and private sectors can work together and that America will be the winner by it. And I believe we've shown that in the Semitech pattern, where we have a situation there where the private sector takes the initiative, takes the lead, while the government provides support and helps remove obstacles to competition. We need to understand the difference between trade theories and trade realities. Most governments look for an opportunity to be helpful in the marketing of exports. And let me give you an example. You get countries in Europe today, a number of them, when they ask another country such as Tunisia, when they help them on aid to them, on a hydroelectric plant, they talk about cement being bought from their country. They talk about electrical equipment, engineers, architects coming from their country. Many of those countries tie as much as 70% of their economic assistance to those kinds of lucrative capital projects. The United States has shunned tied aid. We said it shouldn't be done. And yet we've lost $5 billion in sales a year as a result of that. And when you figure a billion dollars in exports is the equivalent of 25,000 manufacturing jobs, or 125,000 on 5 billion, you can see what we've lost in the way of salaries here, and what we've lost because we've shunned tight aid. I still think other countries should stop that. But we've been trying to get them to do that for years, and there's been a net increase in tight aid. And for us not to do it is the equivalent, I think, of unilateral disarmament when it comes to economics. So yesterday I joined with three other senators in introducing a bill to support that, to put us in the game of helping our exporters get into important foreign markets. Our workers, our exporters, and our economy can no longer afford the luxury of indifference on trade policy. If we want to compete in the world markets, we have to understand that the Queensbury rules often do not apply. In much of the world, this is how the game of trade is played. Many of our competitors have pursued high-tech development programs behind high non-tariff walls providing abundant government assistance for the products of the 90s. They protect infant high-tech industries from stronger, competitive U.S. firms for years while they master the new technology, develop their domestic markets, ignore U.S. intellectual property rights. It took Allied Signal a decade to win patent protection from Japan, and even longer protects its instruments to protect its integrated circuit. I think the absence of an aggressive trade policy aimed at eliminating those kinds of practices has shackled American high technology development. Major new competitors have emerged from the safety of those kinds of tariff walls that would have never emerged had we access to those markets. We need to take a closer look at the trade laws that are already on the books. We need to determine if they can be improved and how they can be enforced. And we have to get the Congress and the administration working together to ensure that strong enforcement of our trade laws is an integral part of our trade policy. A lot of people that look on the Economic Union of Europe as a golden opportunity. But I think the trade policies of Europe 92 are yet to be decided. I was in Europe recently talking to some of the business leaders and political leaders. And I think there's a latent protectionism there under that surface. I think a demonstration of that was the refusal of the Europeans to open up their agricultural markets. 
Hopefully we're seeing some change in policy on that one and that that can be one of the reasons to approve the extension of the negotiations. There are a lot of other things that we're seeing there in the way of procurement of telecommunications, restriction on foreign programs because of cultural protection. We even saw that in the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. In spite of what the Canadians think, I don't think there's that much difference in the culture of the two countries. But I think it's time to do all we can to see that we get full market access to these countries. And Europe isn't the only concern. I see the ambassador of France writing his question. Let me, uh, let me make a point. Let me make a point about France. I was visiting with Mrs. Thatcher. And I said, Ms. Thatcher, are you going to require domestic content on those cars up in the lake country that the Nissan plant is building? She said, absolutely. I said, how much? 60%. I went down and talked to Mr. Ricard, who's going to be here very soon, as I understand. I'm looking forward to seeing him. And I said, are you going to take those cars from the lake country, from the Nissan plant? He said, absolutely not. I said, why not? I said, they have 60% domestic content. He said, we insist on 80. Well, they worked out their differences. It's not 80 now, and I understand that. I went down to Italy. I was talking to Johnny Agnelli. 53% of the car market for Fiat. Treaty they agreed to with Japan back in the 50s that they wouldn't go over 2.5% or whatever the Italian car market was. In those days, it was Japan trying to protect themselves against fiat. I said, well, you're not going to be able to do that anymore on EC-92. And he said, that's right. I said, how are you going to handle that? I said, he said, well, there'll be a transition period. I said, how long? He said, well, <laughs> so I understand. And I understand why you have to have transition periods for things like that. But I must tell you that those things we have done with Europe have worked out pretty good. Because where we had an enormous trade deficit there, that is pretty well wiped out, and we're pretty even. But those same macroeconomic policies don't seem to work for Japan. In spite of all we do and the lowering of the value of the dollar, I look at Japan that takes less than half of its manufactured products as imports. Of its imports, less than half of them are manufactured products. Or look at Britain, it's up to 80%. I think it's a disgrace that industry best American products are still refused access to countries like Japan except under duress. I think we have the tools to promote America's trading interests, to stand up to equal access and equal treatment. And I think that's what we must ensure in the Uruguay round. I don't think we can duck the basic fundamental first principle of trade, that countries that have full access to our markets, we're entitled to full access to their markets. I think trade policy can be a part of the American Renaissance in the 90s. More manufacturing jobs, more open access to foreign markets, policies that make trade not only free, but fair. Because today we're being challenged as never before in economic competition in world markets and our position of leadership. And I think it's important to understand once and for all that trade must be a number one priority for our country. I think it's time for the business community, the Congress, and the administration to give trade the attention and the priority it deserves. Because if there's one thing we've learned is when we work together, business, government, our people, and have unity, there's no challenge we can't handle. Thank you very much.
Senator, these uh, questions uh, were obviously written with your wide range of interests in mind and are no reflection that if they're not about trade, they're no reflection on that uh, extremely fine, strong speech. But it's just because you're involved in so many things and that people here want to know about that these questions may cover a wider range than, uh, than trade. Uh, President Bush's proposal to create an independent commission to study a capital gains tax cut suggests that he is intent on, it, on pursuing the issue. Does the Congress have any interest in revisiting it, or is the capital gains tax cut dead for the foreseeable future? Well, in all candor, I thought that was a throwaway line in the speech. Uh, <laughs> and I know one of the ways we take care of things we don't want to see for a while is have them studied by some commission. Let me also state, I was one of the leaders in bringing capital gains tax down. When it was 49.125, and when it was 28, and then getting it down to 20. Capital gains cut meant an awful lot more when personal income taxes were 70 and 50. And part of the deal in 1986 was that if we could bring the personal rate down from 50, that we'd bring the capital gains rate up. And the argument by the Reagan administration was that if we'd bring the capital gains rate up, we'd pick up enough revenue to pay for bringing the personal income tax rate down. Last year, the argument was the other way. The argument was that if you drop the capital gains rate, you're going to pick up a lot of money. Interesting arguments. <laughs> This is sort of a related uh, question. Uh, do you think that President Bush's high standing in the polls will translate into votes for his position on domestic issues? I think it will on the margin, and for a while. And I think it will on vetoes on the margin. This is a, a, amazingly a, a political question. Uh, to uh, Senator Benson. Four years ago, Iowa farmhouses and New Hampshire town meetings were obligatory stops for a number of your colleagues in the Senate and several governors. This year, with the possible exception of Governor Wilder and uh, George McGovern, no well-known Democrat is making any campaign-like noises. What are we to make of this? Four years ago, the press was saying, these campaigns are just too long. Why do you want a campaign for so many years? People are tired of them, fed up with them. This year, the press says, when are you going to get out there? When does this campaign start? Well, let me say, I haven't heard of anyone calling off the election, and we're going to be there. I, I, let me rephrase that. They are going to be there. <laughs> They are going to be there, <laughs> and we'll make it a very competitive race. <laughs> Some of us took, took note of that pronoun there. <laughs> uh, here is a trade question. Senator Hollings and others are pushing legislation requiring a very high threshold of domestic content. Do you support this approach? No. No. What can be done to stimulate savings in the United States? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Well, <laughs> Senator Roth and I have gone together to work up legislation which we'll be introducing next week. And that's one that restores the IRA. But we're going to make it a super IRA. We're going to put together a, a bipartisan package we have and that package will say that you have a, once again, you have a deduction for $2,000 uh, for 
an investment in an IRA account. But it's going to be expanded to let you do this because you're finding it more and more difficult for young couples to buy that first home. More and more of them are having to live with mom and dad. More and more of them want to be out on their own. And mom and dad thinking that's a pretty good idea too. So here's a chance for grandparents or people for themselves to save that money to buy the first house or to send the kids to college or for a major medical expense or for the retirement. A very major expansion. And then a back end IRA tied to it. And that's one that says that you don't get a credit or you don't get a discount for putting the money in, but it grows in there tax free. And if you wait at least five years, then you can take it out with no tax to be paid on it. So it's quite a quite an improvement on the old IRA. And I think it's going to be a bell ringer. And uh, I'm looking forward to trying to get it in. So look, you know, the problem is we're saving about 4 or 5% in this country, where the Japanese are saving like 14%. The Europeans save much more than we do. We've got to get capital up in this country so that we can keep interest rates reasonable and so that we can have the money to invest in the future of our country. Senator, will the Finance Committee act on health care policy during this Congress? Will, uh, do you think, uh, what will be the uh, impact on the private sector? I know an awful lot of companies that are represented here are beginning to uh, take a great interest in this. That's, that's putting it mildly. They're really uh, hurting a good deal, and they're looking for some federal legislation, it looks like. Well, we'll have some. I doubt that you're going to see a major, major overhaul this year. And I think most of the things will be done on an incremental basis. It's particularly, well, it's a problem for all business today, but particularly for small business with its inability to handle the problem. You know, some 30 to 37 million, and the numbers varies, people without insurance, without health insurance. And about 12 million of those are children. I have done some things as far as the expansion of Medicaid for prenatal, neonatal, and taking children up to the age of six, and now I've introduced legislation to do it to the age of 19 over a period of years. And I put legislation through last year to give a tax credit for working poor where they work for a small company. See, the first thing a small business fellow does, he cuts out some of the benefits, or he cuts out the dependents because he just can't handle the increase. Today, the health insurance is 26% of the cost of small business, and some of them just can't handle it, so they're beginning to drop the policies. And you have problems where people get locked into a small company uh, because you don't really have portability, and so you get yourself uh, some kind of a health condition with one of the kids a heart problem or something else with an inordinate cost. And the next time it comes up for renewal, the company jacks up the rate substantially often or drops the policy. It doesn't renew it. And you get some cherry picking done by insurance companies in that sort of thing. Uh, so that has to be met. So you're going to see some legislation that's going to start addressing those kinds of problems. And it'll be done in my committee. My last question, uh, Senator, it's, it's sort of a, an overall question. It could affect, uh, could apply to and concern uh, trade or trade relations or any other kind of international relations. How do you feel about the role of our allies, particularly the Germans and the Japanese, during the Persian Gulf crisis? And do you think that will have an effect on the way Congress and the administration responds to them uh, in the future? Well, they were slow, uh, but they're coming along, and, uh, and I see that uh, the Japanese diet uh, approved uh, some $9 billion. Uh, I think it was yesterday. Kafu's had a, a very tough time of it there, and I know that. He, he wants very much to do it, uh, but it, uh, it's been disappointing, the fact that they've been slow, slow coming to the deal on the front of it. And it's been disappointing that the Germans have not done more and were not more forthcoming. How long that lasts, well, let me say it just doesn't help.
Senator Benson, on behalf of the Economic Club, thank you very much for a fine speech and presentation.